Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for the tremendous honor you've done me by asking me to come and speak at the annual dinner of the English-speaking Union of the United States. It's a very great honor for me, and I'm very glad to be here. And I would like also to thank you for the great hospitality and kindness that I've received since I've been in New York. I don't think it would have been possible to have had a, a warmer and more generous greeting than I've had here. And I do thank you very much indeed. Now, I imagine that you want me to speak tonight about the Western Union. And that is what uh, I propose to do. And I shall try and get over to you clearly and logically the main features about Western Union and its defense organization. But as in every problem, if you want to get the clear and the unblurred picture, you've got to try and expose the pillars on which the whole thing is based. And therefore, I think, we must start by asking ourselves the question, what is the trouble in the world today? What is the trouble? And my answer to that would be that there are two troubles in the world today. Firstly, you've got economic weakness and distress. And secondly, you've got an ideological clash between two conflicting moral codes. And let's take the first one to start with, the economic trouble. The world is suffering from two great wars. And the second one came before we had fully recovered from the first. That we had a great war leader in those days, Mr. Churchill. And in the hour of crisis, he called on the nation for a sustained and coordinated effort. He promised us only blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And we certainly had the lot. <laughs> but he promised us victory at the end, and with the help of the great American nation and our other allies, victory was achieved. But the direct result of the war is that today there is very great economic distress the world over. And particularly in Western Europe, where the fighting was in a highly civilized area. And the further trouble is that markets have gone astray. And we also know very well <coughs> that the first requirement is economic strength. Now let's have a look at the second trouble, the ideological trouble. That is the linchpin of the structure that is being built by all nations that love true freedom. Now, Americans and British are two distinct and different races, but we speak a common language, and it's far easier for us to stand one an understand one another than for any other two nations. The more your nation and mine mix up with each other, the better for world peace. <laughs> Fighting men of our two nations fought side by side in two great wars. In the late war, I was proud to serve under American command. <laughs> and tonight, I I'm wearing the, the badge of the Chief Commander of the Legion of Merit given me by the President. And it's always a very great pleasure for me to meet General Eisenhower whenever I visit the United States. <laughs> to me, to me, he is Ike, my friend and wartime chief. A and to him, I am Monty. <laughs> we did not always agree. But I've yet to learn that the best of husbands and wives always agree. <laughs> but 
There must be plenty of married couples in this room tonight who very often disagree. <laughs> but I presume they still love each other. And I presume they cooperate wholeheartedly in the home. And I am devoted to Ike, and I'd do anything for him. I believe that the fundamental problem in the world today is not whether this nation or that nation can gain some advance over other nations in science and technology or the manufacture of atom bombs. The fundamental problem is whether the Western democracies can cooperate for a common purpose and gain strength through unity. That is the fundamental problem problem today. Real and true cooperation between nations is not possible unless each nation concerned is prepared to suffer, if necessary, some small loss of sovereignty for the common purpose. Either the cooperation is real and true, or it is a facade behind which nations pursue their own selfish policy. If that should happen, then our dead would indeed have died in vain. Which is it to be? Real and true, or a facet? There can be only one answer. It must be real and true. Therefore, I would say that the worthiness of the Western democracy, democracies to survive will depend on two things. First, on their resolute and clear-headed willingness to defend everything that history and effort and our ancestors and God have entrusted to us. <clears throat> and secondly, on our capacity for real, true, and effective cooperation in order to achieve that end. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the premium is not very great but the dividend will be enormous. It will be peace and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you.